All right, should be live. Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here. Uh, today we are joined by Dave Lee from his YouTube channel, Dave Lee on Investing. Um, Dave and I were chatting. We had had a conversation on Dave's channel um, a couple weeks back, and we didn't quite have as much time to get to all the topics that we wanted to cover, so we figured let's continue the conversation. So we thought we'd kind of do something where we kind of flip the mic around a little bit and Dave's going to ask me a lot of questions and then, you know, next week or two weeks from now, we're going to kind of reverse it and I'm going to go on his channel and ask him some questions. So we just thought today we could talk, you know, a lot about Tesla, what we're, what we're doing and our investment strategies, and then, um, hopefully get into a lot of the Tesla stuff as well as, uh, towards the end, just our general investing strategies and, and things like that. So, uh, hope you guys enjoy it and, um, we'll get started. Dave, you got, a, you got any questions for me? Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I've actually got a ton of questions here. I wanted to ask you, like, how often you check Tesla stock price on a daily basis. <laughs> I wanted to ask you also if there's any price that Tesla can go to this, like, in the next few months that would tempt you to sell a decent portion of your Tesla shares. And I wanted to ask you about your Model 3, you know, purchase, why you got that over the Model Y. Um, so there's a bunch of these personal questions, but yeah. um, I wanted to start <laughs> well, out should we start, with... Should we start with the stock price? That's a great place Actually, to start. I wanted to start out with more Tesla stuff first, and then yeah. kind of dive into more personal things. Um, yeah. I kind of uh, wanted to actually ask you about your investing strategies as well, kind of how you view diversification risk, how you view options versus stock. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd love to just dive into this stuff. But first, sure. I wanted to um, ask your thoughts on Tesla right now and going forward. We know that Tesla has had like, you know, an amazing past, you know, decade. And as we look out, let's say next year, what's kind of the most exciting thing that you see for Tesla? Like, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff like full self-driving, battery factory, Cybertruck, profits, but what's kind of the thing that kind of, you know, tantalizes your focus? Like you're, you're thinking this is the biggest thing that I think personally. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And there's a couple things there. So uh, <laughs> a lot of questions there. Let's start off with this, just the stock price. I mean, I check it a lot. I think um, it's not necessary for people to to check the stock price, you know, every single day or every single hour or whatever. It really depends on your investment strategy, which is some of the stuff we're going to get into. Um, for me, I'm a really I'm really mixed in terms of my style. I do most of my position is long term investment that I really built from like 2013 to 2015, 2016. And those shares I'm pretty much just going to hold. But I do also have um, sort of in my tax protected accounts, more short term stuff that I don't have to worry about, you know, the tax impact of short term trades. So I do a lot of options trading specifically on Tesla in in those accounts, too. So for those reasons, I am, you know, checking it. And then also just because I do Tesla daily, like I have to <laughs> Part of that is being informed on what's happening with the stock and if there are any big movements, you know, during the day or anything like that, I kind of have to uh, be following those. So that's kind of the, the, the thoughts on the stock price. But I'd say in general, investors do check stock prices too frequently. You know, I think mm -hmm. there's some research out there that um, maybe it was like Fidelity or E-Trade or something. They looked at like the accounts that performed best um, across their entire brokerage. And it was actually investors that unfortunately had passed away and were no longer managing their accounts. Because the, the inaction, you know, led to them not making bad decisions where they just let their account go. And, you know, over time it, it built up. So, you know, I think a lot of investors think, you know, I always have to be making trades or I always have to be taking some sort of action. But, you know, every single second, every single minute, every single hour, every single day that you're not doing something like you're holding. And that is a decision in and of itself. So I think I mean, that... Have you um, I'm curious, have you noticed like when you are in certain option trades, especially say for Tesla, that your stress level kind of goes up, your like attention to the stock price kind of heightens, like like how do you deal with that? I would say a little bit. I'm I feel like I manage my stress well, but I don't know. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know that that is fully true because I'm very, you know, deadline oriented and stuff like that. So it must impact me in, in some way. Sorry, there's some sirens going, but um yeah, I think I think it it definitely, you know, changes your mentality a little bit. But the important part for me at least is to to be aware of that and um you know, to understand how that affects sort of your decision making or your psychological approach to investing because it definitely does. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you're just holding a stock and you made the decision, okay, I'm just going to hold this for 10 years, you know, you don't have to really worry too much about what's what's going on day to day, but 
if you're in those trades, yeah, you're you're way more focused on that. It it can be stressful at times, but I think paying attention to your level of stress and and making sure you're not getting into trades that are too stressful is is extremely important. Like unfortunately, I have I do have listeners that'll, you know, if the stock is down 6% or 8% or something like that, you know, they're they're asking like why is this? Like this is so frustrating. If you're feeling those feelings, you know, on a day that the stock is down really any percent, then you're probably either over leveraged or over invested, you know, you need to analyze like why you're feeling that certain way. And I think maybe adjust your strategy so that at least you're not feeling that way or you're not making decisions, you know, based on those feelings. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, um, like, you know, you, you come across as, as very, you know, thoughtful and collected and calm and you would, I would imagine like common stock would fit your personality in some ways, like maybe more, more, more adaptly, but it seems like options, like what is the appeal for options, you know? And I'm curious also, like, what are your favorite strategies? Are you doing more like less risk averse stuff, like, you know, spreads or selling, you know, cover calls or stuff like that? Or are you actually, you know, doing like, you know, uh, calls out of the money or in the money, like kind of what's sure. your kind of risk of tolerance sure. there? Well, okay, so I think we're getting we're getting into the investment stuff early. Let's let's shift back to the Tesla stuff. So you did ask, like, you know, sure. what what am I looking forward to for next year? And we'll, we will come back to that question for sure because that's a great question. Sure. But you know, in terms of like what Tesla is is doing right now and what I'm looking forward to next year, um, I think there are, there are two big things that come to mind immediately for me. I'll start with the first one, which I think is slightly less important. Um, and that is just the the leverage that Tesla is generating with the growth of their business right now from um, an operations perspective, from a profitability perspective. I continue to feel like this is being underappreciated by pretty much everybody, like even on the bullish side, you know, I think some people do understand it, but um, over the last 12 months, you know, 18 months, we've seen that shift where Tesla was negative before in terms of profitability. And now they're suddenly all of a sudden profitable and have been consistently so because they've reached the scale now with, you know, the Model 3 pretty much fully ramped up, at least from Fremont. Um, that's really, you know, changed the the game for Tesla. And I think we're just in the early stages of that. So, you know, last quarter Tesla delivered, what, I think like 137,000 vehicles. This quarter, you know, they're trying to hit about 180,000 to get to 500,000 for the year. I actually think they can do you know, I, I ran through my forecast maybe a month ago. I actually think they can get to about a couple hundred thousand produced this quarter. And depending on how the delivery versus production number shake out and how much inventory either builds or declines, you know, I do think they have a shot at 200,000 deliveries in Q4. So in the span of, you know, six months, they went from delivering 80, 90,000 vehicles to 180, 200,000 vehicles. And that's, you don't see that in businesses that are the scale of Tesla very often. So people don't realize how big of an impact that's going to have fundamentally on the numbers that Tesla is posting. And then we're also simultaneous to that. We're seeing the earnings numbers currently being a little bit suppressed because of Elon Musk's compensation package. So stock-based compensation right now is is pretty high as Tesla hits a lot of those tranches from Elon's um, compensation package. So that I think is, you know, maybe lulling people into this false sense of security about where Tesla's profitability levels are. And I think they're just about to kind of explode here. You know, we haven't really seen price drops from Tesla this quarter. They did, they did it on the model S, but that was about it. Maybe they've done it some in some international markets as well. We saw the introduction of the, um, the new standard range plus lithium iron phosphate model three from Shanghai. Um, but largely it seems like prices have held and they've actually increased the, the price of the full self-driving option. So that's a big one. And then as we've talked about a lot, um, the, a lot of that revenue is deferred. So a lot of that profit's not actually hitting the, the bottom line now from full self-driving. So you have sort of these significant leverages being generated from Tesla's core business. And then on top of that, you're piling on more recognition for a higher priced full self-driving option. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, like profitability just tripled, even though revenue was only up hundred percent or something like that. So mm-hmm. long-winded answer, but that's just Q4. And then if we extend that to next year where Tesla's, you know, growing 50 to hundred percent again, in terms of deliveries, 
and then 2022 when they do the same thing again that's i think really going to catch people off guard a lot of people ask you know oh tesla's price to earnings is like 1200 right now like why how is that not overvalued but if you start to walk through the math you can easily pretty much get to a, a situation where tesla is you know 4xing their earnings or 6xing their earnings with only growing revenue maybe 100 200 so yeah I'll, I'll end it there and then i guess the second the second one i say would say is just full self-driving you know we're seeing the the feature complete rollout now. I think it's going to be quite a while until, you know, things are actually like an autonomous robo taxi situation. But I think all of us have to be pretty pleased that there's tangible progress being made here, um, and in a very exciting way. So I'm really really excited to see how that plays out um, over the next year. Yeah, that's a yeah. I'm actually fascinated by um, by this. Um, your answers because I actually resonate very deeply with with both of these things um, and I think like both of them in some ways aren't fully appreciated uh, regarding operating leverage can you help people who are watching kind of understand kind of what that is and why people might not completely get it initially like you know what's yeah. behind the scenes of that absolutely and this is something that goes back pretty much you know for Tesla's entire history so if we, if you think about a business, especially a business that's growing rapidly, like Tesla's has been, you, you have a situation where you're, you're having to pay for things and scale things that are not going to generate revenue for you ahead of time. And the simplest example of that is, you know, building a factory. So Tesla's building factories in, you know, they're expanding in Shanghai, they're building new factories in Berlin, Texas. Those things are adding cost, and that may not necessarily hit profitability right away because you know it's a capital expenditure. So that's um, on the cash cash side, but it does come back through depreciation and amortization. A lot of that is time based stuff, not necessarily unit based. You know, it's it's mixed for Tesla, but even even if something is it's a capital expenditure, there are still expenses that they have to pay for those. You know, before they're generating revenue. And then if you think about their operations, um, they need to have superchargers, you know, covering basically the entire United States, the entirety of Europe, the entirety of China, that, you know, maybe the utilization is high in some areas, but if we think across the entire country or countries, a lot of those superchargers aren't necessarily being used, but Tesla needs to have them there. They need to pay for those superchargers up front just so people can have the option of using them. But that's a that's a perfect example of operating leverage because they've got to put one supercharger there for the first customer to be able to use it but then as you know their neighbor and their neighbor's neighbor and all these other people buy teslas they can still go and use that same supercharger so you can see like okay in 2014 there was one tesla using the supercharger but in 2021 maybe you know maybe there's eight that are using them frequently and you're generating eight times the amount of you know utility from this that you were back in 2014. So if you apply that across Tesla's, you know, entire business, their service centers, their stores, their supercharger network, even just production, you know, as they get more production out of their factories, the depreciation per unit comes down. So it's just all these things as revenue grows, the costs per unit come down significantly. And that's why you see this flip from not being profitable or where you had all these shorts being like, oh, Tesla's fundamentally unprofitable. Like they lose money on every car they sell. That was never true at all tesla's always made money on the cars they've sold it just hasn't been enough to cover those other costs of the business but now over the last 12 months we've seen that flip to where now it's covering the cost of the business and that's not going to change it's only going to get better and better from here so that's kind of mm -hmm. the the operation operating leverage that we're, that we're talking about sure like one of the um interesting things about tesla the past several years is i have we haven't seen their operating expenses like namely like you know their research and development the general um, SGNA line. SGNA, we yeah. haven't seen it really go up that much. Like you mm -hmm. know, it's been very constant. Whereas their production and revenue has just skyrocketed in the same time. Like, have you noticed that? And kind of, what are your kind of thoughts regarding that? Yeah, I have, and I was actually, you know, that was one of my core, I don't know, core things I was trying to get out there back in like 2017, 2018. I went on this podcast called Inventures in Finance, which I, I later realized was pretty much run by a full-on like Tesla Q person. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I was explaining that concept of like if you look back the trailing kind of three years back in 2017, you were starting to see the signs of that where 
you know, SGNA as a percent of sales was dropping from, you know, maybe like 22% to 20% to 18%. And you could actually look and look at how SGNA compared to forward revenue, because you have to understand that some of those SGNA costs, those are, you know, ahead of revenue because Tesla has to hire people to work their stores before they can sell a car, for example. So you can start to see that ge- that leverage being generated. I am pretty surprised with how how strong they've been or how strongly they've been able to leverage that. Like I would have expected by now, we would have seen those those costs start to increase. But if you look at just the the straight costs, not even the percentages, like you said, R and D and SGNA, they've pretty much held steady for the last you know eight to ten quarters. Even though revenue is probably three x in that period of time, so it's. It's pretty impressive, and um, you know Tesla talks about it pretty much on every single earnings call. But I think a lot of people just kind of sit there and like, oh yeah, like I'm generating operating leverage, like cool. But they're doing you know pretty remarkable work in that in that regards, and you know tons of credit to Tesla and to to Elon and to Zach for um, you know being able to pull that off. Yeah, like I definitely like see that. Like sometimes I call Tesla like a lean lean machine because like. They've almost like done the impossible in a sense. Like they've scaled right an entire Model Three program, factories, Model Y. Yet their operating expenses are like fairly flat. And I'm like, wow, there must have been a lot of focus and discipline. Like in your opinion, how much? Let's say, for example, did Zach Kierkorn, their CFO, like what was his role? You think in this whole thing? Yeah, it's tough to say. I mean. The Tesla's a, a lot of it's, it's a massive company. They have a lot of people making decisions. You know, it's it's never the result of one person. But I would say since Zach has come in, it definitely seems like there has been, you know, more focus on generating generating that operating leverage and, um, you know, keeping costs down, keeping costs in control. And you can you can go back to and around that period of time, they were talking a lot about that on those you know 2018 time period earnings calls. Really, as Model Three was starting to ramp up, and I think. I think Tesla was really taking a hard look at their, you know, their business structure around that point in time. If we fast forward a couple months from that, we saw them go through that period of time of like, okay, we're closing, you know, most of our stores. And then a couple of weeks later, it was like, okay, just kidding. We're not closing most of our stores. We're actually going to build more stores. <laughs> so you could tell, you know, unfortunately the timing around that was pretty bad because the stock was kind of tanking. So it didn't, you know, didn't look the best from a sentiment perspective, but um, you could kind of tell that they're, they're in that reevaluation period. And I think a lot of what happened with the Model 3 ramp up did surprise them. Like it obviously didn't go as smoothly as they expected. And I think that caused them to take a really close look of like, okay, this is, we're kind of struggling here. How can we get through this period of time? Well, we can bring our costs down and that's going to give us more runway as, as low as we can keep those costs. So in hindsight, that might've actually been a good thing that Tesla did have those struggles at that period of time, because, you know, sort of, out of those struggles, there are there are things that are found that are going to benefit Tesla now from, you know, the next two decades. So, mm-hmm. how much of that is Zach? How much of that is situational? You know, who, who sure. knows? But um, I, you know, just in general, I've been very happy with the work that uh, that Zach has done. Yeah, I think on also with operating leverage, it's often underappreciated. Like what you're referred to before with depreciation and amortization, it's like in the early days of Tesla. They're building these factories, but they're really inefficient. You know, like right. they're spending billions and billions in the gigafactory, et cetera. And they have to depreciate, you know, and amortize all those expenses into their current cars um, over time. And so that's a high expense. And it's 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 something that weighs down the, the margins un, until you have like those expenses get, you know, depreciated. And then you have new factories, which are, you know, much more efficient even bigger yeah yeah bigger and they're spread out over more cars and so and they're not necessarily in california (laughs) exactly yeah so i mean can you explain kind of what the impact like how does that affect profitability and like how much do you think that might affect gross margin let's say yeah yeah i wish i had the numbers in front of me i don't i don't have them right now for you know what percent of the costs are depreciation and amortization but the concept itself is pretty simple, you know, let's say you're expensing a hundred million dollars per year, you know, let's say your factory costs $500 million and you're amortizing that over five years. So you're expensing a hundred million dollars per year. If you're only in your first year managed to get like one vehicle produced, 
then the entirety of that cost is going to be applied to that one vehicle. It's going to cost a hundred million dollars. You know, this is simplifying things because it's part of its time based, part of its unit based. So this is a simplified concept, but the, 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 the gist of it is that all of that, all of that expense is going to be applied to whatever you produce. So as you grow your production, you're increasing the denominator, I think. Yeah. <laughs> And that's going to lower just the, the per unit price. So instead of $100 million on one unit, if you're producing a million units, well, instead of $100 million, it's just $100 per car. So as production doubles or triples or quadruples, your costs there come down significantly. And I, I wish I had, you know, what percent of uh, the cost of goods sold or depreciation and amortization for Tesla, but um, it's definitely been a, a major factor in, in terms of how Tesla is able to grow their their gross margin which then you know compounds on down through the line through operational and then final net income so um mm -hmm. yeah it's been a huge factor yeah um yeah i mean i i like i'm very excited about operating leverage and profits um especially like since 2018 or so i was i was like making that the main kind of exciting kind of thesis for tesla in the next few years because partly it's like i don't think a lot of people were understanding like the business model or just the how Tesla will generate profits at a certain point because their operations are so lean as they grow revenue, their profits just increase, you know, radically. Um, why, in your opinion, do you think, um, I wouldn't say like everyone didn't get it, but there were a lot of analysts out there who maybe just didn't get it or just Maybe I don't know if they didn't get it or if they were just emphasizing emphasizing the risks, the current like risks, let's say in 2018 or 2019, that they right. just didn't like really factor in, you know, what's gonna happen this year, next year, and the following years. Or was it something else? I mean, what's your kind of take on like how yeah. this, you know, story is misunderstood? Well, I think it's it's a it's a combination of a lot of different factors. Like you have you have analysts that are, you know, forecasting Tesla to not be able to ever produce or sell anything close to, you know, multiple hundred thousand Model 3s per year, which at the time, if you don't know a ton about Tesla, it kind of makes sense. It's like, okay, this is, you know, this electric vehicle and the market's just, you know, less than 1%. Like this is not going to be the top selling car in its segment. That's a pretty easy statement to make, but if you follow Tesla more closely and you, you know, you've talked to people that have driven Teslas or you've driven a Tesla yourself, you kind of understand like, Oh, this car is like, this is a game changer. And like, obviously this is going to be the best selling car because it's, you know, at $40,000, $50,000, it's, it's way better than anything else that you're going to get out there in terms of the value proposition. So you, you kind of have those competing schools of thought of why, why would this car ever sell this well versus like, Oh, clearly it's going to sell better than its competition. So, on the analyst side, I think you have, you know, they fall more in that first category of saying, like, trying to use benchmarks and using this top down analysis of, like, okay, maybe Tesla takes their share from, you know, 1% up to 2% or something like that. And they sell, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 of these Model 3s and they put that in their model. Well, you're never going to get to profitability with that sort of, with those sort of numbers. So that's a part of it. And then you have them looking at, okay, the margins on the Model S right now are, you know, 20 to 25 percent in general at that period of time and that's a ninety thousand dollar car like okay how how is tesla gonna take that and go to this you know slightly smaller car and all of a sudden sell it for thirty five thousand dollars and then make margin on that so you have them putting in super low margins you know maybe five percent ten percent gross margin which isn't going to be enough to cover your operating costs so then you never have them flipping over you know you have low scale you have low margins and that's never going to flip over into profitability and to their credit, like it's fair to be skeptical of those things. It was kind of, that's a difficult thing that Tesla has done. You know, Tesla fans kind of get it and it was sort of expected, but it's really unprecedented. And, and this is like insane what Tesla has accomplished. So I can't fault anyone for not necessarily predicting that, you know, especially with analysts that have to, you know, have to have something that is defensible in their argument from like, or in their analysis from a numbers perspective. And, a lot of that stuff at that time just just wasn't so if you don't have that scale if you don't have those margins it's never going to flip to profitable and then you have like okay why does tesla have this multi you know tens of billions of dollars in valuation if they're never going to be profitable fundamentally because they can't get to that scale and then it's you sort of lose interest on 
what what's going to happen in 2030 if you don't even see them succeeding you know in 2023 so i think it's it's kind of a combination of all those all Mm -hmm. those little things that tesla just you know consistently has overachieved on those expectations Mm -hmm. and and now we're at the point where people are like oh my gosh like look at what they just did with the model three like it's the leading leading car like model y probably going to do the same oh look at what they did in shanghai they ramped up to 200,000 vehicle per year production rate in 12 months like okay well that's a precedent that we can use and we can apply that to giga berlin giga texas and then all of a sudden the path to tesla being this multi-million cars per year type of company is is like super clear and then you have this competition that's coming out and not competitive so they've given their best effort well it's an even clearer path for tesla so that's why we've seen this shift in valuation so dramatically over the last 12 months is because like all that stuff is you know become clear now mm-hmm. yeah it seems like it seems like part of the world at least the investment world that's been sleeping kind of on tesla or just kind of ignoring it now he's like woke up right and you have this massive all of a sudden. realization <laughs> yeah all of a sudden right? yeah and um the stock price reflects that i mean if i was to be talking with you last year let's say tesla's at 300 at some point uh, in 2000 I, I wish you know <laughs> yeah or, or yeah this pre-stock split price let's yeah say 300 right and i say hey rob um Tesla's going to go to 3000, you know, in 2020. <laughs> like would you what would be your reaction? Would you think I'm crazy or would you Oh like- man. It's so tough cuz like I haven't sold any shares on this um on this like way up. So you're kind of reevaluating things every single day, but you know, if you had told me that at that point in time, I would have been like no chance. Like the market's not going to realize it. And that's been the biggest surprise for me is like how how suddenly the realization has happened in the market for Tesla to go from at their low last year last june they were like 176 dollars per share which would be what 35 dollars right now post split like that's insane 18 months ago 35 dollars. now we're at 600 like almost a 20x in the course of 18 months like that is insane and you know I, ne- I never would have expected that to happen because i wouldn't expect the market to figure this out so quickly like i still think the company i, I think the valuation is fair and will continue to grow so the valuation itself is i'm fine with it it's just i would not have expected the market to apply that valuation but we have seen you know a lot of things come together there's there's a lot of this hype now in the ev space like you know i'm sure we'll talk a little bit about like quantum scape and what's been going on with all these SPACs and all these other electric vehicle makers that now have 20 to 80 billion dollar valuations it's just been you know it's been kind of a crazy year so long-winded answer but you know I, I definitely would have been surprised and unfortunately so because there you know there are people on the tesla motors clubs forums that are like oh i bought these like one dollar seven hundred dollar um, seven hundred strike calls on tesla back in around that time period of time for like january of 2021 and now those are up like 500x <laughs> just like shoot like why didn't i buy those <laughs> So I can't I can't yeah. say I expected this because I didn't position myself yeah. like that. You know, I was coming off a margin call, so I was being conservative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, actually, like, but yeah, I kind of actually, man, I feel like in some ways, like talking with like 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 you and others who have gone through the ups and downs, I feel like a camaraderie of like <laughs> of depthness. Yeah, <laughs> like a, a brother, a brotherhood, a brother and yeah. like, um, been through the ringer. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's it's interesting because you know going through the 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 shadow of the valley of death in 2018 <laughs> or 2019, <laughs> and it's and just holding the shares, you know, like and it took a lot of a lot of um, mental fortitude in a sense to just you know hold through that time and really believe in the future. And like going into 2020, I was like, man, 2020 is going to be a great year for Tesla with profitability, S and P 500, and all this stuff. And I'm like, I could see the stock like you know doubling, maybe tripling. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, and maybe, and you know maybe I should go bigger in some option calls. But then on the flip side, it's like. It's like a person who's had a had a traumatic experience you know, <laughs> right. before that, before that, right. where you're just like, uh, I, sh- I think I'm just happy with common shares, you know. It's like right. just to be part of it. So it seems like if you hadn't had gone through as traumatic of, a, of an experience before, maybe you could have 
took a bit more risk, at least yeah. in, my, in my perspective, you for know, sure. um, going into 2020. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, 500x on option call, cheese. <laughs> Right. Which that's a rare circumstance like that. A lot needs to happen for that to happen. And, you know, part of that reason, I think it's like a lot of us have been a little bit snake bitten by options in the past because like you see this thing that's playing out and it's super clear of like what's going to happen. But you also have to bet on the market understanding that by a certain period of time, which that's like the most difficult part. And people will often like oftentimes play options around like earnings or something. And it's like, okay, we're expecting an earnings beat. And you can be totally right on that. And then the stock can go down and it's just like, well, what the heck? My analysis was right, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is the reaction in the stock, obviously. So having been through that one too many periods of time over, you know, the period from 2013 to 2019, where it's like, why is the valuation still the same? This is insane. Look at the Model 3. It's like the best selling car. Like nothing like this has ever happened before. It's obviously like an iPhone moment of vehicles and there's just no recognition. So it's like, okay, well, when is that going to happen? And you just don't know, like it should have happened earlier. I think we can pretty clearly say that at this point in time, but it just didn't. And then all of a sudden like that, it just, it just happened. (laughs) So yeah, yeah, that's, that's what's hard about options. You have to get the timing and there's, there's deadlines. You have your time decay. It's, it's, it's tricky game. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, betting on timing adds so much complexity because there's so many things out of your control. It's just a completely yeah different uh, ball game. I'm curious, like, have you been tempted at all? Like, I mean, this is like, you know, the pre-split price, the stock is 176 a year and a half ago. Now it's jumped to 3000, let's say pre-split price. Like, are you tempted to take even just a, a bit off the table? Like, you know, just to diversify a bit or to buy a, you know, buy something like a house or something. Model three. <laughs> Well, I'm financing my Model 3, so I guess the answer is no. Um, <laughs> I uh, so as I said, as I said at the beginning, most of my core shares are in my taxed account. So I think you know part of the, part of that kind of locks me in of like, okay, I don't want to pay my taxes. You know, I don't want to have to sell here and then bet on it going back. You know, to going down thirty percent to have to you know cover whatever the difference in the tag twenty percent or whatever. So that kind of keeps me locked in on those core shares and then the rest of it it is options and invariably when i buy options i (laughs) you're supposed to hold them like 50 percent of the way because that's like optimal for time decay versus um you know the implied volatility etc and i always i always am just too bullish where i just like never sell them because i'm just like okay well i still feel good about them surpassing this you know my strike price plus what the premium is right now by the end of the contract so i usually end up holding them um and then you know even through this run-up that that's pretty much been the case for me so i kind of sell when i have to based on Mm -hmm. the expiration of those options um but other than that you know i haven't i haven't really been super tempted probably the most tempting thing would be this s p inclusion because this is it's sort of a weird event you know, that's not really based on Tesla's fundamentals. And I don't think any of us really know what's going to happen. So that presents like an opportunity, you know, if Tesla doubles, I would have to think pretty hard about selling some because I don't think a business that's selling, you know, $30 billion a year in revenue at, you know, a relatively low margin at this point in time is probably not worth a trillion dollars yet. So, and I don't think it'd be able to quite sustain that, even though I do think if we fast forward 10 years, a trillion dollar valuation today, you know, you're still going to probably get a good return on that. But again, it's a, it's about like the market perception and I don't think the market's going to give that much credit to Tesla this early, but the risk for that is, okay, what if they do? And what if that does continue? Like the market can surprise you and it can be, I can't remember that phrase, but like something about it, you know. It's something about longer than you can stay solvent. The market can be irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Uh So, and that applies to if you're trying to rebuy it too, like the market can be irrational to the high end too, you know, longer than you can sit around and and wait to buy. So it's tough. If it doubled, maybe I would consider taking some of those core shares off the the Mm -hmm. options. Yeah. I'll just have to decide like, you know, that's sort of a day by day decision. I have some uh, expiring today. I have some expiring, you know, in like next June. So it's just kind of a mix 
Are you doing like mostly like longer dated stuff, like six to twelve months or longer? Are you doing like short term, or is it just a complete mix of everything? It's a it's a mix. Um, it it just kind of depends. Like if there's a certain event that I'm feeling particularly bullish on, like the S and P inclusion, that's why I have a little bit more of like December stuff. Or if you know, and it it really depends on like what the implied volatility is too, and what the premiums are. So. And that that changes pretty significantly for Tesla. You know, I think it was just around like 50. Now it's at like 110 or something over the, you know, that changed in like two weeks. So that's, that's going to influence like what strikes you're taking. And, um, you know, I'm sure you talked about a lot of this with, with Emmett Peppers and stuff, but um, yeah, it just, for me, it's kind of a, a daily decision based on how much capital I have available to me based on what my positions are at that point in time and just what the events are that are, are occurring. But in general, like the options for me, are, it's a small part of my portfolio. Like I am yeah. mostly just in the core stock. In the core stock. So I see. Got it. So, I mean, your, um, it, I guess your IRA or your tax uh, advantage account, I mean, it must have been doing, must have done pretty well this year, no? <laughs> it's done well. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> not surprising to anyone, Tesla is overweight yeah. in my portfolio. <laughs> it's a... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely like a, I'm not into diversification and I think every, every investor should have their own strategy and it's going to vary by individual. So for me, um, you know, I still have a relatively long time horizon for my investing and I think you got, it's always a balance between like what your income is and what your level of capital is. And I think the more that skews towards income and the longer the time horizon you have, the riskier in general you should be with your capital because you're going to, if you're not taking excess risk, you're not in general, you're not going to outperform. So you have to balance that and find the areas of opportunity where it's, you know, there's the imbalance there. But in general, I would say, you know, younger people that have a longer time horizon that have more of their net worth or more of their, you know, whatever their, their assets coming in from income versus sort of their nest egg, be more aggressive at that point in time. But like once you're, you know, a little bit further along in your investing journey and you've got, you know, those gains and you have that capital, then at that point you have to decide of, okay, you know, maybe 4% of your, a 4% withdrawal rate on your capital is going to earn you more than working your job would. And at that point, like, why are you going to risk everything in like a super high risk investment, like Tesla $700 calls or something like that. So it's, you just kind of have to decide based on your risk tolerance and your time horizon and everything like that. But you know, for me, I do, I do, I don't like diversification for myself personally, because I want to generate those excess returns. And I believe that I can based on my analysis and track record. Um, so for me, I'm kind of like, I'm going to find this one investment. I'm going to pretty much go all in on it. And that's what I've done in Tesla, you know, pretty much for yeah. the last decade or so. Like I, I do have other investments, but you know, Tesla now going up 15 X from probably my cost basis. I don't know if that's accurate, but, um, it's obviously a, you know, the, the vast majority of my portfolio, probably 90, 95 to hundred percent now at this point. So, yeah. Um, it's interesting. You bring up actually some really important concepts here. Um, one is kind of like the impact of loss. For example, if you lose a lot of your investments, it means different it has a different meaning if you're closer, let's say, to retirement or you can't make up that loss, um, right. or if you're depending on that loss, right? You're depending on that money for, for security, right, in the future, versus if you're earlier in life where, let's say, that amount is not, you're not so dependent because you have so much time, you know, to work and income and to save, et cetera. So it seems like those profiles are very different, you know, with investing. And exactly. it seems like if you're, if you're young, especially if you have high income and you're young um, and you're so risk adverse where you don't want to touch anything and you believe that, you know, complete diversification is the way, it seems like there would be some missed opportunity there, you know, because if you can pair, if you could combine the belief that there are these great opportunities that you could find with maybe um, rigorous due diligence and research that could help reduce some of that risk, it seems like there's huge opportunities, um, especially in an age of technology disruption, you know, innovation. Um, if you can catch some of those, you know, a big winner like a Tesla or something, 
it seems like the the reward is just mind boggling, you know, of what you can yeah. achieve compared to if it's just stuck in like a three or four percent, you know, return, you know, yeah. uh, safer investment. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the way that I kind of think about it, like, let's imagine like a, you know, 23, 24 year old and they've saved up, you know, five or ten thousand dollars, let's say ten thousand just for for simple math. If they invest that just in, you know, an index fund, they're going to get maybe seven percent returns. Maybe that doubles in 10 years, you know, lately the market's been doing better. So let's say that doubles in, in seven years or something like that. So you've taken that 10,000, seven years later, you got $20,000. Well, for a 30 year old, $20,000, that's, you know, been working in their career for eight years now, let's say they're in a good financial position coming out of college, they worked through it, their parents paid for it, you know, whatever the case may be, or they've just been diligently paying down their debt, $20,000 for them at that point in their career, if, you know, this is a high income earner is, is not going to be really significant for them. Um, so it's like, okay, well, why not take that $10,000 and try to get maybe a little bit better return by being in something that's a little bit more concentrated that you've done the analysis on and that you believe in, because if you lose that $10,000 while your income, you're going to make up for that in, you know, whatever period of time, less than a year versus if you take that ten thousand dollars and you invest it, and you can find a company that five x's or ten x's. Well, then you're at you know when you're thirty, you have fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars, and that's going to get you you know great down payment on a house, a vehicle. Like that's going to actually provide some value into your life. And not to say that twenty thousand dollars is nothing. This is just sort of an example for this one hypothetical person. That's still a lot of money, but you know it's you can get to a more game changing amount of money from from being more concentrated. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people don't really, you know, think about that way. They only just think about like, oh my gosh, like this ten thousand dollars was so hard for me to earn, and I don't want to lose it. Mm-hmm. But if you yeah, fast forward like fifteen, twenty years, like it's it's that's not going to be that important to you. I don't, I don't I don't know. Yeah, definitely. I think um yeah, I mean, it also helps like if you do have higher income and higher savings rate, right? like um, where you can make that up quicker. You know, if it mm-hmm. takes you like five or ten years to save up ten or fifteen thousand dollars, then it's maybe it feels like it's it is a, you know a much bigger amount. I mean, in your exactly. case, you know, coming from you know the job and industry that you were part of before going full time, um, and having that higher income, did that help you? You think to kind of save more and to be more, a little bit more risk taking in, t- in your in your investments? Yeah, absolutely. And it, like, I didn't have that high of income, but I, you know, I saved like super, super aggressively. Like I, you know, I paid my first, <laughs> my first like six years out of college. I want to say I literally lived in a basement. There was a window, but I lived in a basement. I had two other roommates. I was paying like $600 a rent here in Milwaukee. So that gave me, and you know, I didn't have a car payment. My car was paid off and that gave me a lot of opportunity to you know, put a lot into investing versus someone that's maybe paying, you know, $1,200 in rent. They have like a $300 car payment where, you know, I'm saving a thousand dollars more per month than, than they are. And that's, you know, $12,000 every year that you can then invest in, um, in stocks. So it, those little differences, you know, can add up and you don't necessarily need to be a high income earner. It really is about like your savings rate as you talked about. Um, But sort of on that line of thought, like for me, that's one of the reasons that I didn't do any like postgraduate schooling is because, you know, I understand this, this time value of money and the opportunity that there, there is in investing. So like for me, I was like, okay, I don't want to pay an additional 50, a hundred thousand dollars to get like my MBA or to pursue something in, you know, like the medical field or anything like that, where I'm going to be in school till I'm, you know, 28 or 30 years old and then have a lot of debt on top of that where you know, maybe in five years from then or three to five years from then, I'm finally able to start investing. Well, I'd rather start investing at 22 than at 35, even if that gives me sort of a better, you know, income when I'm 35. I just didn't see see the value for, for that when, when you've got that, you know, that route for investing. So yeah, I mean, the, the summary is like, save, save your money, invest, you know, as much as you can, as early as you can. And I think when you're in that situation, that opens you up to be able to take those risks and to be able to get that outsized reward and that, you know, that's the type of stuff that can, you know, be pretty life-changing for some people. Yeah, interesting. Um, what, what is your kind of motivation for investing? Like, you know, at a certain point, it might be like, you know, there might be some, you know, freedom, it allows for freedom or allows for retirement, et cetera. But I mean, past a certain point, like, 
I mean, is there something more to investing? Is there something that attracts you to it that you see that I don't know? What's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's I think it's two parts. So definitely, like me having having the knowledge of investing and having you know at least a little bit of a nest egg, like by the time that I was you know getting getting ready to like consider taking this podcast full time, that definitely gave me the confidence that like, okay, if something bad happens, at least I can like survive for a little bit with the money that I've saved. So it opens up new opportunities. And, you know, because I had that, I've now made this decision, which, you know, to this point has been a very good decision. I'm very happy with that choice. Um, And um, I feel like I'm just providing a lot more value to the world now than I was, you know, working, working at that corporate, you know, corporate retail job. So for me, even just having that, even if I'm not actually using that money or spending it on anything, it gives you those options and it gives you sort of that confidence and that flexibility to maybe take some time off or pursue this side hustle that, you know, isn't going to make up for your full-time income right away. You you just have that, have, you have more options available to you. And I think that's, that's at the end of the day, what it's all about. Um, and then, you know, looking like longer term for me, you know, Tesla daily is not the end of what I want to do. Like I've said that on the podcast many times. Um, I want to, you know, build this into something bigger that can help more and more people. So that's really what I'm, I'm focused on now is like, how do I get from, from this, where this is today and make this into something that can really change the game for a lot of people. Like I think investing, there's just, it's, it's, it's ripe for being disrupted right now. And we're seeing that with all these Tesla YouTubers. And, you know, I think this is just sort of the the tip of the iceberg. Like the game is changing. It's, it's not controlled in this tight knit wall street group anymore. And I think that's exciting and there's a lot of potential there and I want to be, you know, whatever small part of that I can be. Um, that's what gets me excited about, you know, where this is all heading. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, um, yeah, wall street or research is being disrupted. Um, Mm -hmm. before without the internet and technology it might be like you know just put um held in certain hands that had closest ties to to the management you know but with kind of a crowdsourced model information being public sources being from everywhere and it's being democratized in a lot of ways and i don't think like people understand the full ramifications of how much investing is being disrupted you know it's like we're just in the beginning stages Um, exactly yeah it's huge um i'm curious uh with investing when did you catch that like realization of like wow like i want to do this this is important like when did you catch some vision of what investing could be (laughs) was it something like earlier on in your life or i'm trying to remember here and i'm i'm kind of laughing because I don't really know if I want to say this because it's so ridiculous, but, um, part of it I think has been innate for me, but part of it I learned just like (laughs) when I was a kid, I played this game online called Neopets (laughs) and it was kind of cool. It was like this online, I was very young, like don't, don't judge me too much, but (laughs) I played this game called Neopets. It was like this online game and it had like this full economy. Like you could have a store, you could sell to other Neopets users and stuff and, um, there was like a stock market on it and the currency was like Neo points and you could, you could invest your Neo points in like a bank that had interest and, in, um, in the stock market, which would, you know, generate returns on you and stuff. So like, that's, that's part of where I learned some of this stuff weirdly enough. Um, but I, th- I think I've always just had sort of this like natural interest in it. Um, and you know, over time that involved, like I started investing with <laughs> my very limited capital that I had in high school, just from like working, you know, delivering pizzas and stuff just a couple hundred bucks here and there. Um, I started investing in high school, uh, but even before that, you know, I had, had interest. Um, thankfully my first investment was my first actual investment was Apple. So, um, when you, when you do something like that, it it very, you know, very suddenly opens up your eyes to, to what the potential is. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think, yeah, I think for me, you know, I've always just had a really good understanding of math and, um, part of it is just like wanting to not spend my life, you know, at that point I'm doing things like delivering pizzas, like cleaning apartments during apartment turnover, uh, cleaning carpets. And I'm just like, that's not what I want to do, you know, for the rest of my life to earn money. So that makes learning about investing and investing, you know, very appealing when, when you're kind of doing work like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. I love, um, yeah, hearing, um, background. Hearing about like, Neopets. 
<laughs> no, this is that's fantastic. So ridiculous. Like, no, no, it's not ridiculous in a sense where it's like, no, it's like you 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 cut you cut the potential of of like what I guess currency or things can how you can multiply it or grow it, you know, in environments and and you caught a vision of like, hey, this is in a sense like investing could be like a game in a way too, you know? I yeah, mean there's absolutely. different tons of game theory to involved. Yeah, like there's different factors to to absorb. You could lose or you could win. <laughs> I mean there's I mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I mean, mean it's actually, fun. I, like uh, even for me like yeah. the analysis of it at all, you know, it's it's fun. Just like you know, picking picking the companies you think are going to succeed. Like, that's why I love business, technology, investing, like all this stuff. It's it's so fun to just, you know, watch all this play out. And at the same time, it's not like you're just investing and making some money. Like you're watching these companies disrupt the world. And like, you know, I'm getting a Model 3 in a couple of weeks. Like, that's awesome. I get to have this, this vehicle that's, you know, a game-changing vehicle that when I was a kid growing up, like it, nothing like this existed. So not only are you investing, but you're also learning about like all these technologies and, you know, artificial intelligence and like, um, you know, batteries. Like I had no interest in batteries, like in high school, that was my dad's an engineer, but like, I just never really had that, that skill set. Um, but you know, now I'm here reading about like solid state batteries and like, okay, we know cathodes and anodes and all this stuff. And it's just like, there's a lot of learning that happens. There's a lot of interesting stuff and you know, it's just, it's exciting to be, you know, it's an exciting world to sort of live in and, and pay attention to, I think. Yeah. Have you noticed in your switch from like being an audio podcast to YouTube channel, like what differences have you noticed in terms of your impact, your your outreach, your even your processes? Like how has the difference been? Um, and I guess more specifically, have you noticed in a sense like getting – kind of closer to your audience in a way because you're on video format more and like people maybe get to know you a bit more like what's been your experience yeah I definitely think so I mean before I did YouTube like you know I never I never did a video before I went on a couple like video podcasts I think and you know I was on high, hyper change with Galia a couple of times but you know I was never really out there sort of you know in in person um I've always been myself on my podcast but it is different on video and I, I do think it it's great to have that sort of connection I also think YouTube comments really open up that that sort of connection. Like I always had Twitter before and people could talk to me there. But when you have the comment section, it's kind of like directly on this episode, this topic, like let's all talk about this versus, you know, on, on Apple Podcasts, for example, like there's no comment section, you know, it, users can't interact, listeners can't interact with each other there. So that's one of the things that I think has been great about YouTube. Like not only does it, you know, help people find the content, help me make better content that's more valuable. It also gives, you know, people a chance to interact and ask questions. And, you know, I'm sure you're in the same boat where I think we're pretty lucky. We have very smart people in our audiences and with a very broad set of knowledge, like a lot of engineers commenting on, on videos, if I'm talking about batteries and it's, you can just super quickly like that, learn from these experts in their areas that you could just to your point about research being disrupted, like that's exactly what this is. Like <laughs> research is happening in YouTube comments now. Like that's, it's a weird, but it's, that is the truth and, and it's important. So yeah, it's definitely been, been super impactful and um, definitely was, you know, a good choice. Yeah. Like I noticed like if I say something a little bit off or like people will catch yes. it, you know, it's, it's <laughs> fantastic. It's like, I get my own kind of like a, accountability engine you know where and then yeah. people always like tell me like oh you should look into this or look into that and it's helpful i love it you know it's, it does feel like a group effort you know in a lot of yeah. ways so, yeah absolutely yeah. um are you surprised at all that like a lot of your videos get viewed you know fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, or just like that's a lot of people you know what i'm talking about yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> no yeah i do i do i do know what you're talking about yeah it is it is pretty crazy i mean um and especially because I do, like if I was just talking about Tesla broadly, which, you know, I do, but lately it has been a lot more focused on sort of like the investor angle, which I don't necessarily try to do, but it is just sort of like my natural tendency because that's, you know, that's what I am. But um, it, it does surprise me that there's so much interest in, in sort of like that investing angle. Um, and it's a great thing. Like it's, it's awesome that so many people are out there, you know, wanting to learn about investing and you know, I try to be a good source for information for them. So hopefully that means a lot of people are interested in getting accurate information. And 
you know, I try not to make anything clickbaity. Like I want interesting looking thumbnails. I want titles that are going to, you know, hopefully draw people in to, to learn stuff. But, you know, I'm not out there being like, oh my gosh, like, look at this, like fail of Tesla. And like, they're so, they're so screwed now. <laughs> you know, it's, so it's encouraging in a way that there's, there is a demand for, for sort of what I'm doing. I'm not the most like entertaining presenter by any means. So for people to kind of sit through my monotonous voice day after day is, you know, I guess a good sign. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I look at your stuff as like, you have a craft to it. Like you, it's very like intentional. It's very, you know, thought out. And I think people appreciate that. Like you're putting in a lot of time and effort and they save a lot of time, you know, because you're right. and, researching for them in a sense, right? So like right. you're their assistant in a sense. Right, and, and that's my whole thing is like, I just want, I want the podcast to be as efficient as possible. Like. I pretty heavily edit the audio because I don't want like a single word misplaced in there that is going to make the video longer and make it harder to understand this point. Or, you know, people are just going to not watch it because it's too long. Like I just want to help people get information like as efficiently as possible and as, you know, accurately as possible. And to your point, like I really try to focus that on not even saying a single word incorrectly because there are going to be those people that, that point that out and, and good for them. Cause I want that too, you know, very much a perfectionist, but to, to get to that level of quality is, is, you know, it takes a lot of work and takes a lot of time. And, um, the, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 for one definitely noticed that, you know, attention to quality, the efficiency, you. you know, the, the focus, but then I've also noticed over time, like your video, the presentation has improved and it's gotten like very, like just very top quality. I'm just like, wow, man, you can like, you're like broadcast quality in a sense, you know, this could be like a typically show yeah. on any TV network. I mean, yeah, it's uh, super impressed, but um, it's just a privilege as a person who's, who's seen you, you know, from many years over. Well, yeah, I think yeah. you were the first, first interview we did on the, on Tesla daily back in like September of 2017, I want to say. Yeah. It was, Cause I had I followed your stuff on TMC for a long time. So. Yeah. Know. I remember I was like walking out, walking in like our, uh, HOA neighborhood and it was just like on the phone but yeah, like, yeah it's, uh, it's different and, yeah it was fun we should go back and listen to that I'm sure there were some interesting things there I remember specifically you talked about like autopilot needing to wait for like a version three because it was just like the sort of philosophy that you had that it's always sort of like the third version of something that really starts to take off it's like model three hardware version three like <laughs> exactly yeah because I, actually I remember back then in 2017 people thought or some people thought that fully autonomous was coming just in a year or two, you know, right? <laughs> like, completely. And um, yeah. it's interesting. I mean, um, I, I wanted to get your opinion on full self driving, but first, um, on your Model Three, why did you get your Model Three or order one and not a Model Y or something else? Yeah, um, I definitely considered a Model Y. It was close uh, for me. You know, I don't have a family, so I don't really need the extra space. Um, I, I'm not like a big, you know, outdoorsy camper type of person where I. I have a lot of equipment that I need to haul around other than like the podcast stuff. So, uh, for me, the, the model three fits my needs and then, you know, I'm naturally super frugal. So if I can save, you know, four or five grand from opting for the model three, I'm good with that. And then just having higher efficiency, um, especially I haven't looked at the, the highway efficiency numbers, but I've got to assume that, you know, just based on the, the larger cross section of the model Y that it probably gets a little bit worse efficiency on, on the highway even more than like the differences in the EPA ratings um, for the Model Y versus the Model 3. So once the heat pump came into the Model Y and sort of everything was similar across the platforms, that was like, for me, the deciding factor of like, okay, I'm, I'm good with the Model 3 now. It's been updated to seemingly have the latest technology. I do live in, you know, in Wisconsin, so it is a colder climate. So that heat pump was, was big for me. If that hadn't happened, I probably would have gone with the Model Y. Um, but yeah, it's just a sort of a, a cost efficiency and a, a fuel efficiency type of situation for me. Interesting. Yeah, I, I have a Model 3 that I you know, still have, but I'm keeping it because it drives, like to me, I love the driving dynamics of a Model 3 above any other Tesla, like even like a Model S or Model Y. It's just like, it's low to the ground. It feels mm -hmm. like sporty. And with two kids, like I, you know, sometimes I'm tempted to go bigger, like Model Y or X, but for me as a driver, I prefer like the Model 3, you know, I just keep it because of that, but I completely yeah. understand where you come from. Um, yeah. Are you getting the full self-driving package? Oh, absolutely. That's the main reason I'm getting it. Like, I feel like we're at the point now where, you know, with FSD beta that 
I really want to get hands on and experience these things for myself. Like, I think, I think sometimes people do overemphasize their own personal opinions with, or their own personal experiences with products. And I think sometimes that can be a detriment. Obviously in, in many cases it's extremely helpful, but you know, let, let's take an example of like, oh, this, this customer had a really bad experience with their delivery with the Tesla and like their, they had all these alignment issues or, you know, they had their engine or <laughs> engine, their motor went out, you know, in their first thousand miles or whatever, and communications were terrible. That person, you know, they might be that 0.1% of people that had a horrible experience and they might completely write off investing with, in the company because of that. I think it's more important to, you know, understand the aggregate experience of people. So that's sort of like how I model my investing philosophies. I try not to overemphasize my own personal opinions. Um, I can't remember where we started <laughs> with this full point, but yeah. full self-driving. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. but with full self-driving, I think it is, that's one of the areas where I think it is really, really difficult to understand without actually experiencing it for yourself and understanding, you know, how it performs in a variety of use cases. And that's so broad that it's difficult to ascertain that broad perspective from a broad set of people. Like you just have to read so much and you'd have to, you know, understand all the characteristics of all the people that you're reading and how accurate they are with their information and stuff. So for me, this is the point where it's like, okay, I just need to have my hands on the wheel and see how this, this does for myself because it is, you know, this is a critical part of Tesla's valuation at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense because I think a large part of the full self-driving experience is very nuanced too. It's like, like how you it's feel. It's difficult to like explain exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's like yeah. this intangible part. Um, with full self-driving, um, why is it that that's one of the most exciting things that you're seeing for Tesla next year and going forward? Like, what's the big deal? What's the significance of full self-driving? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think people understand that. Like, I think if, even if we don't have full robo taxi, autonomous robo taxi, Tesla network type of situation, um, like we had talked about with the operating leverage, the reason Tesla's valuation is so high is because they're able to sell that software package for $8,000, $10,000. Even if that's only to a, a certain fraction of their users, that's still having a massive impact on their, you know, profitability, their operating leverage, all, all this stuff. Um, and that's that's what takes Tesla from being a hundred billion dollar company like Volkswagen or Toyota to being, you know, I think eventually multi trillion dollar company. Um, it's, it's really that software leverage. Uh, you just it's it's really difficult to to get to those sort of valuations on on hardware margin alone. So, um, from a business perspective, excited about that. From a personal perspective, like this is just game t- changing technology that's super exciting. Like I can't wait to, you know, I've, I've been. I've experienced autopilot, obviously, but I haven't experienced, you know, the full self-driving beta yet. So it's going to be pretty cool and exciting to have this car just, you know, driving you around through intersections and stuff. And, you know, having the opportunity to even just experience that, I think is cool in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you envision the rollout for full self-driving? Like when, right now it's a very limited beta, it seems, but when do you think wide release will happen? When do you think it progresses, it gets good enough where we see the first deployment of, let's say, robo-taxis in a limited area. Well, so Elon on that recent interview said, you know, he thinks full level five, 2021. Um, I would definitely not be as bullish as that. I think, you know, just judging on the progress so far, I think we're probably still a couple of years away. It's tough because in some circumstances it performs super well, but it doesn't it doesn't have like it doesn't have everything yet. It doesn't have the all the edge cases that you would need to have for a full self-driving standalone vehicle with, with no person in it. Like a Tesla can complete a trip right now without any interventions. Like that's awesome, but it needs to be able to complete those, you know, all those trips <laughs> you know, every day without any interventions. And that's that's a big, big difference from being able to just do it on some occasions. So, and then we have things like smart summon stuff and, you know, I'm not, have you, have you seen any videos of smart summon with the full self-driving beta? I feel like I haven't seen many of those. Not yet. really. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not sure why that is, but you know, obviously the performance of smart summer and smart summon hasn't really lived up to, you know, what it was touted to be so far. So those are some of the things I want to see, you know, better performance in, in the parking lots and 
I want to see that a Tesla can actually go and park itself. So those are some of the stuff, things that I'm waiting to see that I, I haven't seen yet. And some of that may just be, I need to look for it, but, um, I still, th I still think we're a little bit of a ways from that. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I like, I've been like, as you mentioned back in 2017, I was like, Hey, this is going to take some time because people were expecting the cross country drive and in a year or two, everything would be autonomous. So I'm like, this is a tough problem. You know, this is like, you've got a lot of edge cases and you're dealing with safety, life and death of a person. So um, it's going to take longer than what some people think. But then more recently, I've kind of shifted actually personally where I think Tesla has hit some type of tipping point um, with their latest rewrite, also with their you know Dojo, Dojo computer coming online probably next year. Mm -hmm. I think there's something where they have nailed the infrastructure and they've nailed all the major pieces where it's just a matter now of improving with data and training. And so I think people are gonna be super impressed by the, the rate of progress the results and I think by the end of this year it's going to be like people are going to start to catch it like wow this is huge but but by the end of next year I think this thing is going to be pretty good I don't know like exactly the, the rollout in terms of which mean which areas are going to have robot taxis or not because each municipality will have to determine like you know their own regulations but like I think um yeah I, I think I think it's like um, it has momentum, you know, this is, this is yeah. the time where I'm, I'm getting very bullish on, on full self driving. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's to, to what we were talking about earlier. Like, that's why I want to have my hands on it. So I can kind of judge that for myself. Cause right now it is, it's difficult to like fully process and understand that from just like watching a couple of YouTube videos, which, you know, who knows like how much of their experience they're sharing and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I definitely want to experience it myself. And then, um, but to your point, like I think we've been maybe lulled into this false sense of like slow progress because of what has been going on behind the scenes with them really doing this rewrite of fundamentally how the system is working. Um, <clears throat> and you know they've, they've been talking about that, of course, but we haven't really seen much much progress from it up until this full self driving beta, because all this stuff has been happening behind the scenes. So it's kind of like, oh well, you know, they they reached this local maximum and progress kind of tapered off. But now we're in this new sort of, you know, space where they have this rewrite and now we're seeing progress like rapidly every week. And if that, if that continues, then that bodes super well for, you know, when we're 52 weeks out from here where they've just kept, kept iterating. And the other, you know, tailwind that Tesla is riding here is just the amount of data that's coming in. It just continues to be amplified and amplified and amplified as their, you know, their fleet grows so quickly, you know, 500,000 vehicles mm -hmm. this year maybe 850,000 next year, something like that. Like that's gonna, it almost doubles the fleet in terms of what the, um, in terms of like the hardware three fleet. So that's another thing that, you know, I think is gonna be super beneficial. And then as you mentioned with Dojo, like that's that's kind of why I say maybe a couple years from now, because I think once they get Dojo going, they'll, I feel like they probably need that before it's really ready for like an autonomous taxi type situation. So that's why I think maybe, you know, two to three years from now, we could be in a situation where, where that's happening. But I would, I would love to be wrong on that. Like, I think people do underestimate the rate of progress sometimes in situations like this. So yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, definitely. So it seems like we have, um, operating leverage and profits, you know, that is super exciting. And then you've got this whole full self driving. So just those two things are just immensely like, they have immense potential, you know, for Tesla. But then Tesla isn't stopping there. They've got this whole Roadrunner line, 4680 cells, cell to chassis to stuff going on. Um, and then they've got all these factories, right? You have Austin, you have Berlin, Shanghai expanding. Um, like, in your opinion, I guess, with these new production of 4680 cells, like, how do you envision, is this, like, is it going to be a challenge for Tesla to get up to speed and actually be able to make Model Ys with these 4680 cells? Do you, do you envision more of a slow ramp? Or do you think that Tesla has something up their sleeves and they're actually going to like ramp in decent amounts in Berlin yeah. and uh, Austin? I think, I think I feel like a little bit of both because I do think there are going to be issues ramping. I think that's the biggest risk factor in my mind for, you know, 2021. Um, 
But I also think Tesla's probably a little bit further down the road than they have let on. You know, they've already got the pilot line running. They already have successfully created their own battery cells that are in their products that they've been testing. You know, if you listen carefully to what they said at Battery Day, they they were cautious, but a lot of the caution was around the rate, the yield rate. So they're able to do this. It's just a matter of doing it well enough that the yield rate is high enough for it to be cost efficient and to be fast enough, obviously. So, you know, it's a matter of they've, they've got these things down. They just need to iterate on them and improve them. And I think that's something that Tesla is insanely good at and it happens, you know, pretty, pretty darn quickly. Like if we think about the Model 3, how, how sort of painful that felt at the time just because they kept missing targets. If you actually look at it in hindsight, they went from doing nothing to doing, you know, thousands of vehicles a week in a year. And this is the first time they've, you know, done any sort of high volume manufacturing pretty much at all. And they've got experience with that now. They've got experience. Um, I think they've been probably working on this pilot line stuff for, for quite a while now. And for them to publicly put those targets out when I think setting aside sort of autonomy, I think Tesla has been relatively conservative in terms of what they've been able to, you know, what they've communicated publicly about, you know, vehicle deliveries and stuff like that. There, there's definitely been more caution there. So for them to publicly talk about this, um, and we got to remember too, battery day was like six months delayed. So they really intended to actually do this back in March. And I think maybe that sort of um, throws people off a little bit in terms of where Tesla's actual progress is at. So I think it's kind of, you know, I'm talking out of both ends of my mouth a little bit there. There is definitely risk to that production ramp up and we shouldn't count that as like a foregone conclusion. But at the same time, I do feel like Tesla's probably pretty far along in the process. And some of the stuff that they mentioned as, you know, potentially having issues like they don't necessarily need all that stuff to to actually get a product out out the door and into a car like it'll it'll be a continuous sort of improvement type of thing so uh yeah that's sort of sort of my thoughts Mm -hmm. do you think they'll actually be able to produce more than let's say 10 or twenty thousand cyber trucks next year by the end of the year Ooh, cyber trucks i don't know i'm more Mm -hmm. bullish on the the model y from berlin just because that's a a vehicle they've done before. Um, Cybertruck, I think, is probably going to be pretty slow in terms of how it ramps up just because it is, you know, that's an entirely new new type of vehicle, you know, with the exoskeleton um, manufacturing process. And there needs to be new things developed by Tesla to be able to do that. So I'm not as <laughs> bullish on, on that ramp up as probably I am on the just the 4680s in general. Um, 2022, I think, for sure, they'll, they'll do a significant number of Cybertrucks, but, you know, when we when we think about Cybertruck's a different product category, but if we look at like the semi and the Roadster, um, you know these these carry new technologies with them, and those have definitely been a little bit slower than what we have seen. Tesla says that was because of the batteries and stuff, which you know totally makes sense. But I do think it's gonna you know probably take a little bit longer for the Cybertruck. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your guesstimate in terms of what year do you think Tesla would make a Tesla RV? <laughs> Is that a personal question there, Dave? <laughs> no, I need to know. I need to know. <laughs> I've got I hope they do. do. I've got yeah, no. to do. So, um, I hope they do. I mean, so we got to think, you know, the next big focus is going to be sort of that $20,000, $25,000 car. Um, sure. Sounds like that'll be like an international project, though. Probably designed in, you know, maybe Shanghai and Berlin or something like that. But if we think about like products coming out of Fremont or coming out of Texas, um, I wouldn't be too surprised if that was on the roadmap, you know, at some point. It's tough because I, I don't know. Do you know the volume of like RVs every year? It's got to be not not all that high, right? I forget the exact volume, but it's actually decent. Okay. It's like, uh, yeah, hundreds Like worth of doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, if they did, like that's the dream, right? Is having this autonomous RV that you, like it's a mobile hotel room that you just like turn on and it just goes wherever you want. Like that's awesome. And hopefully Tesla yeah. does that. Which, if they do, that's going to be disruptive to, like, the hotel industry, too, which is, you know, a lot of people aren't talking about that or thinking about that yet, but it's going to be, especially with this Airbnb uh, (laughs) IPO, it's going to be interesting to to see how that plays out. Uh, um, While we're on kind of the future, future stuff, like, are there any crazy future products or things that you think Tesla might get into that just is unexpected or just... um, yeah, like, let's say 10 years down the road or, you know, even 15 years down the road. Yeah, 
you know, the obvious ones are obviously like home HVAC system, electric jet. I would love to see Tesla do something in the water space, you know, ships or boats or personal watercraft. I don't know that the market, you know, it might not justify that because this is what's tough about Tesla is they're going to get so big so fast that all of these sort of categories that would be super exciting for consumers are potentially going to be not that beneficial to Tesla's business at the scale that Tesla's going to be because they're going to be producing, you know, in a decade, I think probably 20 million cars a year doing trillion, you know, over a trillion dollars in revenue. So it's like, okay, well, what markets are going to enter then that are worth your time? And they become sort of fewer and fewer. So it's tough. I don't know. I mean, I guess what I would say is when we think about it, like when we frame it that way, it's probably got to be something that's, you know, technology related. And I would say that comes back to what Tesla's doing with Dojo. I think there's probably opportunity to extend that maybe in sort of a way that is similar to what Amazon's done with AWS. Um, you know, Tesla might be able to leverage their, their skills in that area to, to sell those resources off to other companies that are also looking to do things with artificial intelligence. So if I think about like a product line that, you know, has potential for Tesla where they're going to, that's going to matter enough to the scale that Tesla's going to be in five, 10 years. Like I've, I got to focus in on something like AI related, you know, it just kind of has to be of that mm -hmm. sort of, you know, scales. Interesting. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was, um, this past yesterday, I was watching this, uh, IPO roadshow video of DoorDash and I think they're at like a $55 billion valuation right now um, with local delivery. And it was fascinating because they're trying to create a local infrastructure, logistics infrastructure. So they say, oh, food is just the first step, right? We're creating this thing where local businesses can give goods and services to anyone, anytime. Um, and their goal is to help these small businesses kind of survive and succeed in a new economy. And I was thinking about you know, it overlaps with Tesla in some ways because of delivery, you know, transportation, because that's got to be one of the biggest kind of hurdles or costs. And then you have Uber being valued, you know, almost $100 billion. Um, and I wonder, like, what's your kind of take on the future of Tesla in delivery or in logistics? Like, do you think these companies like Uber or DoorDash or even Instacart, you know, like, they provide a great service, like we order stuff and we get the food, but like, how do these companies compete in a world with robo-taxi, you know, right. it just like cuts the cost of transport so drastically. Like, I mean, yeah, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great thing to think about. I think uh, it's something, I think when people think about autonomy, there are a couple of things that they think about, you know, like semis autonomously delivering packages and then an Uber type of situation where you have this, you know, car you can summon and it drops you off. But I think that's sort of like the first order of thinking. There's going to be a lot more that develops just out of the sheer lower cost of what an autonomous vehicle can do. And I, I haven't spent a ton of time thinking about what opportunities there are, but there are definitely things that are not happening today that are just going to be completely new that are being done with these autonomous vehicles that you know, just doesn't exist today. Whether that's like car sharing in the suburbs or, you know, whatever else, like all these, everything that DoorDash is talking about, like, yeah, I think it's irrevocably intertwined with what Tesla is doing with autonomy. And whether Tesla decides to sort of pursue those markets on their own, under their own, you know, corporate structure, or if they want to decide to partner with some of these companies, because it's not necessarily going to be worth Tesla to just like try and do everything. And I think if we think about robo taxis, like that's, that's one of the cool things about Tesla's business model right now is like allowing customers to actually buy those. And then customers are taking care of sort of the infrastructure, which is really cool for Tesla because that generates leverage. So yeah, maybe they'll give a better rate to these people that are operating these robo taxis than they could get on their own. But they're also saving all of that capital cost from having to like find garages for these robo taxis and things like that. So 
diverting a little bit from your question there, but I think logistics business is going to be huge. You know, how Tesla plays in that TBD, but they're definitely going to be involved. You, you can't not be. And I think that extends to all of these like pers- personal logistics type of situations too. Um, and yeah, probably all the stuff that, that DoorDash is talking about would be somehow under Tesla's, you know, realm of <laughs> what they can play in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember like, I remember like, this is probably 2014 or something. I was like at a Tesla event. I think it was their Powerwall event, their first Powerwall or something around then. And I was talking with um, JB Straubel back in the day. I used to make sure to go to every Tesla event because the management were just hanging around, you know? Yeah, they were like, small enough then. Talking, yeah, I missed that period of time. Yeah. I was just like, I would do anything and everything I could to, to go to these events. But I was t- talking to JB Straubel and then we're talking about kind of, you know, transportation. And he made something, an interesting point. He's like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's transporting, you know, uh, from point A to point B. And it could be people or it could be goods. And so I was like, huh, oh, it's like even in 2014, Tesla is thinking about transporting goods and people, you know, point A to point B, looking at it really from like a first principles point of view. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why they're so all in and in, in autonomous driving, because like this is clearly the future. It's like, you know, the most efficient, best way. But with delivering goods, one of the challenges I see is you send a robo taxi from the grocery store, from the restaurant to the person's house or apartment building, how does that package, that food, that whatever, get from the car to the person or in front of the person's house? Yeah. Like you need a person then, right? Like so the robo taxi fulfills like eighty or ninety percent of the of the route, but the remaining ten or twenty percent, it's like that's a huge challenge, you know? It's like, do you think Tesla could make a robot? that would take the food, the bags or whatever, the package from the car to the person, but then you would deal with like elevators, you deal with like city streets, you deal with, you know, there's so many situations. So it seems like a huge challenge. Drones would be interesting, but then there are regulations. Would you really want drones with big packages flying above people's heads, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know, what are what are your thoughts? What are the, the, the no, choices? It's a, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, so I'm thinking about it from like my perspective. So I live in an apartment and for us, it would be super easy because that would probably just be a role that would be taken on by like the apartment management. They would just collect those packages and, you know, put them in the mailboxes or whatever they need to do with them when the cars arrive. So I think that would be pretty simple from my perspective, but for, you know, a suburban house, like then what do you do? You got to have some way for it to get out of the vehicle and, you know, you can just have it sit there until the person comes, but then you know, obviously they need to sort of schedule it so that the person is there and that's not ideal either. They could have something where it's just sort of like pushing the package out of the car, you know, at this point in time, maybe it's not even, doesn't even look like a car anymore. Maybe it's something else, but there could be something that just sort of, you know, shifts it from being carried by the car to just being on the side of the road or something like that. But that's not ideal because then you, you know, your package is just kind of sitting there. So you're left with, you know, kind of what you said of like, okay, well, how do you get it from, the driveway essentially to actually into the house and yeah I don't know I don't know that there's going to be a good solution for that anytime soon so I'd imagine it comes down to sort of like scheduling and and things like that or having I don't know maybe there's someone in the car that <laughs> we get back to having a person you know yeah, exactly. it's kind of like the model three ramp up of like oh people yeah. are actually pretty good at doing stuff yeah, yeah. so I don't know I- I think the challenge is interesting because it really is going to require some crazy like creativity, engineering, you know, something to finish that last, you know, 10 or 20%. And of any company out there, like it seems like Tesla would be the, the company to, to, to do something, you know? Um, yeah, I find it well, I definitely know There are definitely companies out there that are working on, on that. Like I've seen, I don't follow it super closely, but I've definitely seen um, articles or videos talking about these sort of like package delivery robots that basically do what you're talking about here. So there are definitely people working on that problem. Um, and I suppose if we can have full self-driving cars on the road, like why not have something that is not on the road, that's not going at high speed, that's also autonomous and 
you know, first principles thinking, like, obviously we should be able to do that. So I think it's just a matter of like cost and how those robots all get around and if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm curious with full self-driving going forward, some people have speculated that, oh, Tesla is going to stop selling cars to consumers because they will use all of their production for robo taxis. And so some people think that in the future, it'll just be Tesla's robo taxis and and everyone will do ride share. Some other people might say, oh, maybe there'll be a couple years where Tesla is just producing a ton of robo taxis for their own networks and maybe they sell only like a limited amount to consumers because they're using a lot for the robo taxis. What's your take? Do you think Tesla will continue to prioritize selling cars to consumers or do you think that's in flux? I do because that offloads a lot of problems um, to the consumer, you know, to some extent, Tesla's kind of already doing that of like, they're offloading the the problem of collecting data to the consumer. And it's sort of a win-win, you know, the consumer gets the car and they get to use this great technology. Um, but it's for Tesla, it's better than having to pay a bunch of people to go drive their cars around. So to some extent they're doing that, but I think, you know, back to the infrastructure point, these customers are going to take care of the car. They're going to take care of, you know, where to park it, um, charging it, things like that. If Tesla wants to have their own robo taxi fleet, they need to have a plan for doing all that. They need to have a plan for maintenance. They have to have somewhere to store it. It can't just drive around roads all the time um, when it's not being like from, let's say midnight to like 5 a.m. when there's pretty low traffic. What are you gonna do with these cars if they're not in someone's garage? You're gonna have to have your own garage or you're gonna have to have, you know, again, just have them driving around, which is a poor use of our road infrastructure and a poor use of the the vehicles, um, you know, capacity. So. I think they're going to offload a lot of that to customers for the foreseeable future. You know, maybe at some point it makes sense for Tesla in some localities to to have some of that infrastructure in house. But I would imagine the majority of Tesla's plan is to let customers take care of that. And Elon has mentioned a couple of times about like you know taxi drivers becoming these sort of fleet managers, and I think that gives a hint of you know what he's got in his head of how this is all going to work out. Mm-hmm. All right, Rob, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up my Yeah, that's uh, a great, that's a great spot for it. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure. I love talking, chatting with you. I feel like um, we're in the middle of a lot of historic changes in our world and society. And I think Tesla and, and also SpaceX in some ways, too. Like, yeah. There's a lot of companies, but, but it feels like it's fascinating to see a lot of these changes happening before our eyes. And not just the changes, but to see it also in terms of the market dynamics and investors' like views and sentiments changing, and it's just a fascinating journey, I think. Um, and um, I think, yeah, there could be many years to come, you know, to see yeah. what this story, how this story will tell. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, awesome. Thought. Hand it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, so like I said at the beginning, we're going to do another one of these in a couple of weeks where I'll be on Dave's channel kind of asking him a lot of the, you know, sort of type of questions that um, that he asked me today. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about um, SpaceX and some of the other companies that, you know, we're following or that you're following. So, um, yeah, so Dave Lee on investing is the YouTube channel. Make sure to uh, check that out. I think you're at HeyDave7 on Twitter. I think I got that right. Yes. Um, so definitely follow Dave on Twitter. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you coming on, taking the time to, to ask me some of these questions today. And hopefully you guys all enjoyed the discussion out there. Um, and yeah, that'll wrap it up for me uh, for the week. And I'll see you guys on, what is it? Monday, December 14th for uh, S&P 500 Inclusion Week. Big week. All right, thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Awesome.